Good day, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our uh, alumni panel here. Uh, we have two great alums from the Masters of Education programs here at the College of Education from the University of Illinois. I am Travis Giffen, the uh, Assistant Director of Online Programs. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we also have two other folks from online programs uh, here on case you have questions about online programs that uh, they will maybe be able to answer your questions before I am as uh, we're going through uh, the session this evening. Um, they are uh, Brianna Davis and Sangeetha Gopala Krishnan. Um, also, while we are getting started, I have a few quick questions so that we can get to know uh, everybody uh, this evening. Um, I have just started that poll. Also, feel free to type in the chat, introduce yourselves, um, let us know uh, where you're from. Um, we know we usually have folks from all around the world, so no matter what time it is uh, for you, thanks for joining us uh, now. I will give everyone a little bit of time to answer these questions um, before we get started into anything else. Don't want to take away from the uh, discussion this evening. All right, I will let that poll uh, end. I will get that poll here closed in a moment. Um, with us this evening, um, we have uh, two wonderful alums and I am gonna go ahead and let them share a little bit about themselves. Uh, then I will have some questions for both of them about their time as students. And then uh, some two questions uh, for them about their current careers. In between those two sections, we will have time for Q&A so that we can keep a Q&A focus to what it was like when they were a student and then a second Q&A session on uh, their careers or information uh, related to that from both of them. So Josh, would uh, you go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody, uh, let them know uh, what program you graduated from, uh, when you graduated um, and just briefly what you're doing now. Uh, we'll get more into that later. Sure, yeah, I know we got a lot of ground to cover, so I'll keep the introduction uh, pretty short. Uh, my name is Josh DiVincenzo. Um, I graduated in 2017 from the HRD program, um, and I am currently the Assistant Director of Education and Training at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Climate School, as well as a lecturer within the Columbia Climate School. Glad to be here. Thank you so much, Josh. And Justine, could you uh, introduce yourself also? Sure, I'd be happy to. So hi, everyone. I'm Justine O'Connell. I actually just graduated from my program this past December in 2022. I was a part of the EPAL program, um, the Education Policy Organization and Leadership. And currently, I am the director of global initiatives at Mercersburg Academy, which is a nine through 12 boarding school in Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about my experience and what I'm doing now. Thank you so much. I see we had a few folks that just joined us. Uh, you can go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, tell us uh, who you are, where you're from. Uh, we have, uh, I'm seeing uh, both current students and uh, some prospective students here uh, with us this evening. Uh, with that said, going to go ahead and get started into the, the questions for both of our panelists. So the first question I have for you both, um, we'll start with Josh and then Justine for the first half, and then we'll swap the order for the second half. Um, so the first question that I have for both of you is what were you doing before you started your program? Sure. Uh, so to get started, uh, before the program, I was working within a learning technologies and solutions division at a regional bank out in the Midwest. Uh, so the program in HRD was very much aligned with uh, what my day to day looked like. And it also I was offering a lot of the flexibility to kind of uh, get immersed in this new kind of learning technology space, as well as kind of uh, lean into my um, uh, experience at U of I with the literature, kind of the scholarly work behind the frameworks of why we were doing everything day to day. But uh, I got my career started in the financial sector, uh, helping out the uh, learning and development departments. Thank you, Josh and Justine. Yeah, so before I started my program, um, I was actually still at my current school. I joined in 2019 and 2020. Um, 
And a lot of what I do is related to international students. My high school student population, about 25% of our students are international students. Um, I also organize all of our student travel that happens during spring break and summer break. And um, I did the EPAL EDM program. I was able to do the EDM as well as um, a certificate. So my certificate is in um, international education administra administration and leadership. So that directly ties to my work with the international students as well as um, the organization of international and global ed. Um, it was really interesting because a lot of research that I saw um, and programs were about higher ed, but this program allowed me to explore, um, have classmates who were focused in higher ed, but then you know, boarding school is kind of like a mini microcosm of higher ed in a way. And so it was really neat to see the differences between that, um, post-secondary education and um, like the high school students that I have now. Thank you for sharing. I know uh, a lot of students uh, in the Global Studies and Education Program also uh, do that uh, International Education Administration Leadership Certificate. So next question I have for you both is, why did you select the, the program that you selected um, for your um, EDM? Yeah, that's a good question and something I've definitely uh, reflected back on uh, in preparation for today. Um, I think a lot of the selection process was at the, that point in time in uh, what I was aiming to do is very much exploratory um, in the sense of uh, I knew I wanted to work in Ellen learning and development in some sense, but uh, I didn't really know what the parameters were for that or what uh, uh, context I wanted to work in. And I think the specific program um, within, uh, at the time, HR, HRD there, um, offered a ton of flexibility to to kind of take an exploratory approach to it. So I got to learn a ton about kind of the emerging technologies, but then I also learned a ton around globalization and kind of global political and international education. So I don't know, when I was doing my research into a master's program that was also going to allow me to uh, kind of stay um, at a steady pace and not necessarily leave the the, the job market, um, uh, this one stood out because of how many different perspectives you're going to get exposed to. So it wasn't kind of one single lane or one single uh, discipline and never felt that way. It was kind of like a uh, pick and choose what you want to learn about and put it into a program. And I thought that was extremely appealing for where I was and what I was trying to figure out with uh, my next career step. Thanks for sharing, Josh. And Justine, how about you? Definitely similar to Josh in terms of the flexibility in the course offerings. Um, where I live now is rural South Central Pennsylvania. And so what I was looking for was an online program from the start, because for me, my options are really limited in terms of being able to stay in my current position, which I really love what I do and where I am, and also be able to further my education. I'm both a classroom teacher and an administrator. So I was looking for a program that will allow me to learn and and research about both aspects in education right so i was able to take classes on um, education and and technology and how that is developing and changing how we are teaching and preparing students for a world that is going to be vastly different from the time they enter high school to the time that they leave high school or the same for university level students and then I was also able to take more administrative classes which allowed me to look into things like the history and um, um, you know, development of things like study abroad programs at both the higher ed level, but I was able to have the, the flexibility to look at it from my own lens. So my classes really allowed me to be able to, within the scope of the class, choose topics that were related to the work that I currently do. And, and I really liked U of I's program in, in that I could do an EDM, but then also have a certificate that allowed me to concentrate more towards what I'm currently doing and what I'm really passionate about. Thanks for sharing, Justine. It's great to, great to hear that uh, our program was able to meet uh, both your needs in, in different ways. Um, so last question I have for, for this section before we uh, get to Q&A. Um, is what advice would you give to uh, to kind of few parts to future students that maybe haven't made a decision about the program? And then what advice would you give to current students that are still working through their classes um, as you know they're they're working towards graduation? 
you know, the two part questions are always tricky. Um, so I guess I'll start uh, first with future students, prospective students. Um, I think uh, uh, when I initially started the program, I assumed that I'd kind of be able to kind of uh, fly under the radar and just kind of do the coursework and, uh, you know, be, it'd be kind of on the uh, going on in the background a little bit. And uh, one thing that was kind of a pleasant surprise was with my program, that wasn't the case at all. It was very much uh, uh, high engagement in terms of getting to know other uh, students in the class. So for future students, um, although it, it is a distance learning program in many cases, uh, um, you're very much embedded in an academic environment. And uh, now that I've kind of worked in an academic uh, environment all the time, I would say it's a very strong academic environment, even if it's uh, facilitated uh, online. Uh, so the other thing is uh, not only with peer to peer, it would be with the faculty. So the faculty were uh, uh, very inspirational for me uh, throughout. So I think that's another, um, you know, just treating it like any other type of master's program where you want to develop uh, these academic relationships with your with your faculty and uh, uh, get to know their research and um, and they are very accessible, which is also another surprising factor for me uh, throughout. So um, I think that's just uh, for future students to take advantage of all of that. Uh, I had um, my U of I professors be the ones that wrote my uh, letters of recommendations for my doctoral programs when I was on the search for that. So it was it was those relationships that um, were almost organic, but I, if for future students, I, my recommendation would be even seek those out if it's not necessarily an organic uh, process there. Uh, for current students, um, it's, again, just such an exploratory time within the literature. I think that's something that's really unique and something to take full advantage of is that uh, you do get such a diversity of perspectives and thoughts. And, and uh, sometimes I know the reading seems very tedious, especially after a day of work or whatever you have uh, multitasking. Um, but I don't think there's been a period since uh, from a research perspective that I've been able to be that uh, involved in the reading and, and that uh, kind of emerged, uh, um, submerged into just kind of thinking critically about these different topics. So uh, that would be my uh, advice future and uh, current students. Thanks for uh, thanks for that input uh, and for handling the two part question well. Uh, Justine, do you want me to repeat the question or are you good? Um, I think it's advice for potential students and then advice for current students, right? I yep. mean, Josh gave a great answer already. Um, so. Yeah, I think that for future students, um, for me, it was a lot about um, finding a program and, and being a part of a program that is the first program I've done since undergrad. And so I allowed myself to, to have some experience in years working. And so I was really nervous about doing a distance learning program and um, doing it while working full time. Um, but what I actually really loved was the fact that my semesters, I could take two classes in a semester, but they were eight weeks at a time or seven weeks at a time. And so I was able to really focus on one class. Um, I think that for me, balancing two classes while the pace would have been slower, um, for me personally would have been a lot harder. Um, like I said, I work in a boarding school. I actually live in a dorm with teenage girls. So like being able to do those two things on top of working and living with students would have been really difficult. And I really enjoy being able to focus and zone in on one class and one topic and really dive deep, very intense, but then be able to switch and focus really and dive deep in the second topic. Um, so for potential students, if that's something that, um, you know, piques your interest in terms of being able to balance work, um, if you're planning to work and study at the same time. Um, and like I mentioned before, you know, being not being afraid to to ask about where to go with the material, right? So while the topic of the class um, might not necessarily, for me, sometimes it was geared towards higher education. Reaching out to my professors and saying, you know, hey, is it okay if I take this and go and research more towards high school, or see see if there's even research out there about high school level students and study abroad and things like that, or international high school students. Um, and they were really open and, and interested in hearing about that. Um, not many people know about this independent school world that exists here in the US. Um, and so being able to just openly ask questions to my professors and that connection was never lost, even though we were virtual. I've never met, I've actually never even set foot in the state of Illinois. So like just even knowing that I have those professors who were readily available um, before and after classes and, and via email and the connections that I've made with students from around the world. A lot of my professors um, 
had had group work, but were really intentional in providing time for us to collaborate and hear each other's ideas. And that was really amazing to me for, for current students. Um, similar to what Josh said, like, I don't think since I've only been out of my program for two months now, but since then it's, I miss being able to be focused and having that opportunity to really read and, and be critical about the topics that I was seeing and, and having that um, time to really carve out to be able to, to read and um, focus on these different areas. So definitely continue to take advantage of that um, as you continue your studies. Thanks for that great response also, Justine. Um, I know that we hear uh, very often from, from lots of different students in the programs that they uh, having the eight week classes and being able to take you know one class at a time. Uh, a lot of people find that very advantageous, uh, especially uh, while working. Um, so now uh, we are to our first, first uh, Q&A session uh, time uh, this evening. You can go ahead um, and you can submit questions in the chat and I can read them out so that people in the recording uh, have that question um, and then gives an opportunity for uh, both our panelists uh, to answer that. I think we're doing pretty good on time right now. Um, so unless somebody has a specific question for one panelist or the other, um, panelists, um, we can give an opportunity for, for both of them to uh, answer. Um, so with that, uh, you can either raise your hand um, and I can either uh, call on you and you can unmute yourself um, if you would like to ask the question or you can go ahead and type those in the chat. Some questions that we've uh, had before while folks are thinking just to help generate some ideas um, would either be, you know, uh, advice for uh, classes to potentially take um, that uh, both of them took uh, really and really enjoyed uh, during their time as students, um, or even, you know, maybe some tips for uh, preparing for uh, either exams or something like that. So I guess a uh, thing uh, as we're still waiting on questions for folks, uh, for both of you is if you I know it's hard, but if you had to pick like one class that was your favorite class um, that you took, uh, do you know what class that you would have to pick? I gotta think way back. This is, um, I, uh, I don't remember the course name, but I remember the professor's name, if that helps. Um, uh, this was with uh, Professor Berbulis. Bur 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 uh, I think it was a technology in HRD or technology um, e-learning course. Someone maybe needs to kind of double check what I'm saying with that one, but that's the professor's name. Uh, but essentially that course is really, really interesting. And uh, I think it was uh, the first pro approach of learning around like learning technologies from a very humanistic standpoint. Um, I think that professor has uh, kind of a background actually more on the philosophy side, which was something that that convergence is not something you typically see where it was kind of talking about um, what this idea of being hyper-connected means. And this was far before the pandemic and kind of everyone pivoting to these virtual spaces and we were able to kind of learn and synthesize what that meant uh really early on in that coursework and um also rooted in kind of very practical things that we were seeing on the day uh the day to day so um that course definitely stands out to me but i think um across the board i don't think i had a course that uh, wasn't kind of formative for me during during my studies there oh perfect thank you. <laughs> thank you in the chat <laughs> Yeah, I think that I took that same class that you were talking about, Josh. I think it was like education and technology reform, maybe. Um, but I do remember, I think that was actually the first class I took. And what I found really interesting was that many students were a part of the HRD program or the other types of EDM programs. It wasn't just necessarily someone who was in EPAL like myself. So that to me was really great to be able to collaborate with people from different perspectives, people who worked in ed technology, who were you know, doing different um, advanced degrees as well. One of, I think my most recent class was with uh, Professor McCarthy. It was the Globalizing Educational Policy. And I really loved it because we took a critical lens on the globalization and, and study abroad and, and ethics of study abroad and, and how we approach that from a higher ed or, you know, this idea of youth and what is youth and what does it mean to travel now in a globalized world. And so that was one of my favorite classes that that I took. Um, 
And then also another class that I remember, I know I'm a little, maybe a little more fresh because I just finished in the last year um, was researching global education. And so the implications of educational research in international contexts. Um, and that was with Professor Kang, who I also believe is the lead in, in the concentration that I have. So it was really great to have her there and her and I were in constant communication about just ideas and, and where we are. But those were two of my favorite classes on top of the educational technology reform. Thanks so much. I think we got some great questions in the chat, so we should be able to get to those two, but we also have a hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead uh, with that uh, question first. You can go ahead and uh, briefly uh, introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Leila, and I'm really interested on the one that you took, Justin, I believe. Is that how you say your name? I think so. Um, but uh, my question is, is it for every single program that we're able to, is it two courses per, per, like per semester always? And then we can always just divide it, like taking one first and then another one, or is it just in some, some, like some, some semesters, some courses? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so to give you an idea of my timeline, I started in the summer of 2021 um, and I kind of just like, powered through. Some classes aren't necessarily offered every um, term or like some aren't offered in the summer, for example. Um, and you'll see in the different programs, you'll have your foundational courses that are required courses. Um, I had like an educational psychology class, but I could choose from a list of them, um, which allowed flexibility in what I wanted to study. Um, and so they're not necessarily offered, for example, in the fall, you have kind of like fall A and fall B or like the beginning and the end of the fall semester. Um, so I tried my best to see where I could fit everything in. And, and my, um, and Dr. King was great on helping me out in terms of making sure I was getting, staying on track with the classes that I needed to take in terms of the required classes, the different foundational classes, as well as my electives. Um, so that helped me plan. There wasn't necessarily an order. For example, I didn't need to take one class before taking another. Um, so I kind of just pick and chose what worked for me. Um, I think looking back, my last class that I took, maybe I should have taken that one first because it really would have set up um, how I looked at the other classes. But in the end, it allowed me all together to be able to take bits and pieces from everything that I was learning um, in, and put it into that last class as well. So um, I found it to be really flexible. It did take some time to kind of see when things were offered and, and make it work for me. But like I said, I, in my program, didn't have to take classes in a specific order. Thanks for sharing that. Also, uh, only because it's very, uh, relevant here to, to everybody. Um, if you have questions about like your course schedule or, or planning and things like that, um, we do have a online student advisor in addition to your faculty advisor. So Brianna Davis, who's here in the chat uh, is our online student advisor. Um, and even if you have questions about what that schedule or things might be uh, before uh, applying to the program, uh, you can reach us at online programs at education.illinois.edu and we can help you uh, come up with a plan or answer some of those questions related to that. Um, I did also see, uh, we had a great question, um, that was asked, let me get, scroll back to it. Um, so, and neither of you may have taken advantage of this, um, or been able to at the time. Um, but we got a question that asked, uh, did either of you use any, uh, career services, um, while you were here, uh, or working on your, um, EDM program? And, if not, I have uh, some information that I can add. It was really nice to know it was there. Uh, I didn't personally use it, but it was, it was really interesting to know all the different uh, university services that were available. Um, I'm sure later I'll, I'll go on and on about the library system because that was a, a really nice surprise, but also things like career services being offered was, um, it was, it was really just nice to just know it was there if we needed it. Uh, similarly, I didn't take advantage of career services necessarily. I did browse it here and there just to see what was there, but because I was already in a job and I'm still in a job that I really enjoy, I wasn't necessarily looking for anything new. 
So one thing that I can add here is also in addition to the career services uh, with the, the university, I'm also available to support uh, current students. So if you have questions um, about uh, coming up with any you know, career strategy or plans or things like that, um, my calendar is available uh, for one-on-one -on -one appointments uh, with students also. Uh, let me see, we got another question. So, go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to help. Um, there is a question about advice for working professionals. Did we get to that? Nope, did not get to that. Yeah, so do you have any advice uh, for uh, working professionals? Um, and then, and I don't know if this was the case for either of you, but I think the other uh, aspect um, was, especially for somebody who's maybe taken some time in between their, their undergraduate program uh, and then exploring a master's program. Um, yeah, so I took six years between my undergrad and my master's program, and for some people that might seem like a lot, maybe for other people it's not. <laughs> um, for me, there was, if I'm being completely honest, a learning curve in terms of the amount of reading and the, the amount of time I was expecting to take in my reading and really understanding the readings that I was doing. Um, I was a pretty good student in undergrad. And so I just kind of assumed that it would be similar, but um, working and doing the readings in that first semester, especially, I guess I should, I lie a little bit. I started it in the summer, so I wasn't in work at that time, but then in that fall, it kind of hit me pretty hard in terms of the beginning of the school year is always hard, plus keeping up with those readings. So that first eight week session, um, it, it took me, I was kind of kicked into high gear in order in, in terms of um, allowing myself the amount of time that I needed to read and prepare for my classes. I, a lot of my classes were writing based or um, project based and, and not necessarily quiz or test based. And so that allowed me to get into the groove of, you know, really setting aside time either daily or every other day to either read or to work on the upcoming um, assignments. My professors were all great in terms of their syllabus and when things would be due. Um, so I had that ahead of time. Um, but that first eight week course in the fall semester uh, was definitely a struggle for me. But then you kind of get into your own groove and, and figure out what what system and what um, schedule works for you. Thank you, Justine. Yeah. And I was just going to answer the question uh, for advice for her um, uh, kind of studying while working. Um, so I think uh, my best advice for that would actually just be uh, extremely transparent with your team and your manager. Um, I think that was a really good tactic out the gate was just kind of letting them know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this thing outside of work. Uh, it's going to take up some time. Um, and I think for the most part, just making sure your team's on the same page. And, uh, and I would say for the most part, in most cases, they're going to be very supportive of it. Uh, oftentimes, my team members would ask, what am I learning about? Or if there's anything that I read about that would be applicable to what we're trying to solve for uh, that given week. Um, but just being on the same page with my manager and uh, having them know, you know, I'm um, there was never an instance where necessarily like I needed to kind of like play that card of, oh, I need to go study. Uh, but I knowing that I had the full support of my team and the organization knew that I was also a student um, helped out quite a bit. Thank you. So I see that there are a few more questions. I'm, this is going to be the last question for this section. I also see that there is a question about uh, courses that both of you think uh, would be really helpful in preparations for industry. I'm going to save that to the, the second part after you both uh, share a little bit about um, what you're doing. Um, but I did want to uh, get to this question with the um, time differences. I know, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you both are slightly out of uh, central time. Um, but I'm sure you both had classmates that were in different time zones uh, around uh, the globe uh, attending class. So I didn't know if, if either of you uh, would be comfortable or uh, able to provide any input on what that's like uh, working uh, outside a time zone or having seen uh, peers uh, in different time zones. Yeah, so I am on the East Coast, so it's just right now at 6 30 p.m. Um, and so that wasn't it actually worked in my favor a little bit it, it allowed me some more flexibility once my work day was over to take a breath and then be able to begin work 
Um, I did have classmates all over the world, um, depending on the class. Uh, some, I remember a classmate in Jordan, one in Hong Kong, um, others in um, around the US and professors from what I remember, and many of them recorded their classes. I don't think I had a single professor who made you know, participation mandatory, but really it was more of like, this is a, uh, a, you can talk to your professors if that time difference is really difficult. Some, for some people it was the middle of the night, for other people it was the middle of the day. For classes where I had group projects, we were able to make things work, whether that was through Google Docs or LMS, um, or, you know, just being really upfront and transparent with each other. I, in my experience, my classmates were all really understanding of one another when it came to things that were more difficult, like time zones. Um, I don't know about your experience, Josh. Yeah, I was just gonna echo that too. I think uh, all the group projects where that was kind of a factor, uh, we all kind of put our heads together and made it work somehow. I remember there was one time where we had maybe two or three different time zones represented and we basically had to use iMovie and patch a presentation together. But uh, all in all, we uh, took advantage of the collaborative documents and all that. Um, so I think uh, from your peers perspective, that I don't think will be a barrier. Uh, it's really, we all kind of understand and uh, we learn a lot um, from each other too. So it's, it, it, I haven't seen it be a barrier yet. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I think that if, at least we think that it's a really big benefit um, that we have students from all over the globe be able to add uh, different perspectives and uh, insights uh, in the classroom. Um, with that, we're going to shift over to the uh, second portion of the program, uh, have some more uh, career related questions and then open up for uh, Q&A again. Uh, this time we will start with uh, Justine. Um, so the first question I have, uh, I know you briefly shared what you were doing uh, in your career before, but could you share a little bit more uh, about what it is uh, that you do uh, and are are doing uh, for employment? Sure. So like I mentioned earlier, I work at a 9 through 12 boarding school. Um, I work, we have currently this year 36 countries represented and over 30 states in our student body population. So that's about 445 students. Um, I'm the director of global initiatives, so I run our model UN program. I also organize and facilitate our st um, student travel programs, as well as work closely with our international students, their orientation when they arrive on campus, um, and different meetings and things that we do around um, throughout the year. This year, I was asked to be a part of our civic education task force so we are working in the very infant stages of creating a center for civic education but knowing that global education and global citizenship is a vital part of what it means to be a civically educated um, citizen in in 2023 and beyond and so my education through this master's program has really helped me to understand um the cross-cultural dynamics, the the perspectives that maybe our students are might be facing that might not be necessarily visible to others in our campus community. And so being able to be a part of that conversation and know that my school is really interested and focused on bringing global citizenship to the forefront of our students education. Um, like uh, Josh was saying about his his uh, where he was working while he was studying many times in those conversations, my colleagues would ask, you know, what have you been reading? I took a class on youth and global citizenship, which was awesome and really, really informative in, in at least helping me to develop and bring ideas and questions forward when thinking about what we're doing as a school moving forward. Um, I do a lot of risk management when it comes to student travel and overnight travel. We obviously work with minors, so that's a huge part of it. Um, but then also looking critically at our programs that we've historically run to other places in the world. And, and what does it mean to be from an elite boarding school in the US and traveling to the global south and, and what are what is our why and our purpose and can we look at this in a more critical way to make sure that we're teaching our students, you know, um, what travel is and how to critically look at why we're traveling and making sure that we're being stewards of, of global citizenship as an institution so um, my work is really uh, awesome if some people might think that I'm crazy to live in a a boarding school, but it's it's really great. I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's interested in in this 
kind of world. Um, I've been a part of it for almost five years now, but um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at in my career. Thank you. It sounds like there's never a dull moment. Josh, could you uh, share with us a little bit about yours? Um, and uh, congratulations, by the way. Bye. Excellent. Uh, yeah, happy to dive in. Um, so one thing I should mention is uh, through my my master's uh, degree, I was really inspired to actually go on for a doctorate. Um, so I was really much, very much interested in the, uh, and I saw the shout out to the library, but the library for me was kind of a, a tipping point, a uh, turning point of just getting really involved on the academic side of research. And uh, so that led me to relocate to New York. So I left uh, L&D from the financial sector's uh, perspective and uh, wanted to go on and be a full-time academic, but realized uh, I also needed to find a way to fund uh, th those studies. So to do that, um, there was a couple grants that were be that were awarded at, at Columbia to look at training and education programs for um, the entire United States tribes and territories around uh, disaster preparedness on economic and housing recovery for hurricanes, droughts, fires, and all of that. And uh, so I joined that team on as an instructional designer uh, to kind of uh, put the pieces together. And then from there, a lot of the work that I had learned in my master's was about actually managing these programs. Uh, so after uh, uh, kind of going um, and trying to touch on some points in the question there around how to get involved in L&D, uh, but after starting in instructional design, eventually uh, I moved up to uh, senior instructional design and was able to kind of see across different projects at that point. Uh, the pandemic was happening. And one of the other things uh, that was really interesting from uh, combining my master's studies to what was going on in the real world was we had to pivot to blended really quickly because at, at that point the federal government uh, was really interested in kind of pausing all training because there everything had historically been we fly instructors out it had to be face to face but uh, if anybody has gone through kind of the HRD program they'll be kind of the first one to raise their hand and say why don't we flip it why don't we do asynchronous components we do some live uh, components and leverage uh, learning technologies for it uh, so I got to be that person in that meeting to kind of say let's flip it and we were able to maintain uh, training the the country's first responders uh, throughout the pandemic to 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 today on uh, a lot of emergent issues at that point. Um, and then recently, I, I was able to step into the role as assistant director. Uh, our portfolio has since grown, uh, so now we are working on uh, a climate literacy training and education program uh, for the federal agencies. So trying to get different uh, government agencies involved and interested in climate change, uh, as well as some new emergent projects. Uh, one project that. Uh, is worth noting is uh, we are currently working uh, on a project out of Warsaw, Poland on uh, helping teachers uh, navigate uh, uh, traumatized students uh, on the Ukrainian side, so Ukrainian refugee students. Uh, so a lot of that is uh, a long way of saying that touched many of the points of my degree because I was taking an HRD route of how to learn and manage learning programs. Um, and then also this global component, this global HRD component that uh, equipped me to kind of go into many of these uh, unknown contexts and uh, very geopolitical and sometimes uh, interesting uh, conversations around the world around uh, these themes, but then translate them into what our organizations, what our agencies, what our local, national, international leadership needs to know about these things. So it's been an interesting career and uh, it uh, keeps me busy as well. So. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you so much for sharing, Josh. Um, so while we get this next question going, uh, everybody can start thinking of questions that they might have uh, for either of the panelists. This will be the last question uh, that I have, and then we'll open things up for uh, Q and A again. So for for both of you, what's you know one piece of advice that maybe you would give to somebody who's looking to move into your field or advance in your field? Um, I think for me, this is the first boarding school I've ever worked in. I lived um, in South America previously for about four or five years and worked in a school there as well. Um, independent schools in the U.S., uh, day schools and boarding schools is kind of its own world. Um, it's very interesting in terms of uh, what schools are looking to do in terms of creating global citizens. Um, one piece of advice and one network that I'm so thankful to be a part of, especially during the pandemic when our travel was halted, but really work to continue to have 
uh, opportunities for students to connect across the world was Global Education Benchmark Group. And our school has been a member of that group. It's really a K through 12 um, organization that is essentially in my role, at least in the high school world, is, is usually an office of one. And so that group has been a really great resource for me. They post jobs, but then they also have a ton of resources within the community in terms of risk management and program building and best practices that we have meetups for different global directors um, in different regions around the US and virtually. Um, and so that's one, one place I would definitely uh, point people towards if they're interested in getting into uh, global ed at uh, at the high school or K through 12 level. Um, I'd be happy to drop that name and website into the chat for people who are interested. Um, and that's that to me has been like my lifeline, I think, in the first few years here and continues to be. Um, and then, yeah, just continuing independent schools. I know that it's a very interesting time in education, especially in, in middle school and high school. Um, and it's it's uh, a great resource, National Association of Independent Schools and, and TABS, if you're interested in the boarding school life, if you're a little bit crazy like myself. <laughs> Thank you, Justine. And, and Josh. Yeah, I would say for learning and development, um, it's uh, a couple things. I think the first thing is that it happens in so many different contexts. I think, um, uh, sometimes it, uh, we only envision L and D happening in like a organization or a, a private sector organization, but it, it really happens everywhere. A lot of the different research grants and proposals that come through, there's always like an L, uh, a learning or education outreach component to it. So there's a lot of different areas in which you can practice learning and development. I think that's a, just something really to be aware of. Um, and then the other thing more on the practical side is just, um, thinking about the best ways to translate theory into your practice. I think uh, there's uh, a lot of excitement coming out of the program where you know and you can list off all these different theories and frameworks and um, then you're sitting around the workplace and no one knows how to operationalize it. So if you're already kind of thinking ahead of, uh, you know, how would this look like in, in practice or uh, how would I implement this or are there pieces of this I, I should implement? What are the limitations of the framework? I think you'll be in a really good position for that. And then uh, one thing I think just lately that uh, sticks that sticks out is just seeking multiple solutions. Um, so there's really, uh, if you, you can be at a really good advantage in learning and development, if you can come up with uh, three different uh, solutions or use cases for the same problem that an organization's facing. Uh, so beginning to think like that, I think will give you uh, really a strong strategic leg up. Thank you both for the advice. And thanks, Justine, for uh, adding those uh, organizations into the chat uh, for folks. Um, now is the time we open things up for uh, questions from everybody in the audience. Um, so we will see how those come. Uh, question that we got. Um, actually, Brianna, would you be willing to answer this question uh, in the chat? A question about uh, financial aid uh, for online graduate students. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, so for online graduate students, financial aid is available if you're registered for a minimum of six credit hours per semester. For your reference, um, each of the courses in our program are worth four credit hours. Um, so that would mean that you would need to take two, two courses per semester to qualify for financial aid. Thanks, Brianna. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, no, that's okay. Sorry, can I ask one like follow up question to that? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so for that, do how do because I applied right for the masters already. Um, do I wait until the decision is sent to me? Like, hopefully I get in, but if I get in, then that would come with the financial aid or is there any separate things that I have to apply for financial aid? 
Sure. So I would highly recommend that you check with the financial aid office um, if you have specific questions, um, but just on a very basic level, in order to be eligible for financial aid, you do have to fill out the FAFSA. Um, so if you haven't filled out the FAFSA yet, you can do that at any time. So even if you have not yet been admitted to um, the College of Education or to the university, um, you can fill that out. Whenever you fill that out, it will ask you which schools you would like to have your information sent to. So be sure to indicate the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, that will ensure that your information is sent to our financial aid office on campus. Um, and then, you know, if you're admitted to our program and you decide to register for courses, you will start to get more information from the financial aid office about your next steps. Um, but just at the very basic level, you um, will need to fill out the FAFSA um, for the academic year that you would like to um, take courses. And again, you can do that at any time. Thank you. While folks are thinking of questions, one question that we did get earlier, I think you both kind of touched on this a bit already, um, but just to make sure that we got the, the question answered was, oh, uh, there was a question, what kind of courses uh, would you recommend uh, taking? I think this is directed to you, Josh, uh, for in, what was it, in learning and design? Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, a lot of what I learned from managing HRD was actually really useful uh, when you have to manage those programs. Um, so there is a class actually called managing HRD. Um, so I would recommend that it kind of takes more of the managerial approach to uh, how these things are are done. Um, but then also looking at kind of the fundamentals of like e-learning. So there's like e-learning and learning technologies. Um, again, uh, I don't remember the exact names of these courses, but that's kind of the themes. Uh, but uh, that is also just a really good practical one, um, as well as one that can give you kind of a uh, up to date reference of the different technologies that are out there, things that you can expect to see your teams using or other uh, teams using. Um, but those would be the two main ones I would I would recommend. Thanks, Josh. And yeah, if anybody thinks of uh, other questions about what type of courses or what might be in some of the courses and things like that, uh, you can also uh, you can uh, email us at online programs at education .edu. We still got some time here for everybody. Oh, got a question. Um, so what uh, immediate uh, challenges would somebody expect upon uh, entering into a learning and development role? Uh, budget, one, um, and then two, uh, maybe the org chart. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on both of those. It really depends on the organization and what budget they're putting towards learning and development. Uh, that can either make your job very easy or make it very challenging where you have to come up with some very novel solutions uh, to, to be under budget on a project. Um, and then the org chart is, uh, so learning and development, uh, you'll see it in kind of different levels of maturity based on organization. So sometimes uh, like if you're going to a startup environment, uh, you might be the one L&D person and you are the entire department, you're the instructional designer, you're the manager, you're uh, the liaison between leadership, where if you go into a, like a large corporation, there could be 30 plus people in your L&D team. And there's, uh, it's kind of more spread out in terms of you have a consultant, you have a project manager, you have an e-learning, and then you also have everything in between that. So um, those are some of the media challenges. Uh, if you go into L&D, you really want to kind of do your homework on the organization that you're going to be entering, uh, kind of what their uh, philosophy and resources uh, dedicated to L&D is. Um, and kind of go from there. I think there's uh, exceptional learning in both cases. So if you end up being the one person L&D department, or if you are the one of 30 L&D department, um, those are both great uh, experiences to have because you'll carry over somewhere in kind of a happy medium. But those are usually the, the main challenges in L&D. Uh, so you're asked to do a lot with a little in most cases. Uh, so it, it, it takes a little bit of innovation there. But um, does that answer your question, uh, Phil? Yeah, thanks. Yep, awesome. Thanks for getting that answered. Um, I, we have a, another poll before uh, folks uh, 
need to uh, run out. So I'm just gonna launch this to get some feedback going. But I uh, did think of a question for, for you, Justine. Um, what are like some skills or maybe uh, other applicable applicable careers or something like that that somebody would maybe want to highlight if they were uh, you know applying for a position uh, getting started working at a boarding school? Wow, that's uh, that's a big question. I mean, obviously, something that's different about boarding school is really what they call like the triple threat, right? So I one night a week will do. Uh, dorm duty, right? So that's actually tonight after this, I'll be on dorm duty. But then either being a classroom teacher or an administrator, and then many of us like coach or do something outside of the classroom. So community engagement, um, sports, theater, dance, like I said, I ran model UN. So that's my extracurricular activity. So I think someone who is in, very interested in education, but maybe not in the traditional sense of inside the classroom all the time, a lot of what our students learn happens outside of the classroom in those moments in the dorm on the field or you know in a model UN conference, for example, so some skills that I think people would really benefit by having when applying to a boarding school would be. Um, you know being flexible being honest um, being able to collaborate you're working on many different teams so not just your department your academic department, but then also in your dorm family that we sometimes call so that dorm faculty who work in the dorm with you, your coaching staff that you might work with. So you're a part of many different teams. Um, and it, it really is a lifestyle. So something to consider is it's it's not necessarily that, you know, um, class day, there are things that happen off um, in off hours. Um, and for example, you know, our kids live far from home. So you're a de facto parent in a way, right? So you might go and cheer them on at their game or in their theater performance when parents are sometimes thousands of miles or a different continent away. And so that's something definitely to consider when considering a boarding school. Um, and there's boarding schools of all types and sizes, different areas. Like I said, I'm in a really rural area, which I like. Some people uh, might not like that um but there's some in dc and in uh, the northeast especially um up in new england but um there's different sizes um, and styles of boarding school all over thank you for that insight any other questions from everybody in the audience thanks again for everybody who uh provided feedback on the, the two different polls that we had this evening, really appreciate that. Thank you again to the two panelists uh, for joining us this evening. Um, it's exciting to hear that we have people who have already applied to the EDM program here with us this evening. So uh, we are excited to hear that. Uh, and I think uh, the EDM applications closed today, right Brianna? Brianna, they closed today. So you should, uh, anybody who got their applications in uh, today, I think you should probably be expect to hear something in about a week or so. Looks like we got, uh, don't really have any more questions, but I'll give folks one last call for, for questions um, before uh, we uh, end things for this evening. All right. Thank you all for uh, attending the panel tonight. Uh, thank you to both of our guests, uh, the great uh, input uh, and feedback uh, to be shared. Uh, again, uh, this uh, was recorded, so it'll go get sent out to uh, everybody about 12 hours afterwards. Um, thank you all. And from online programs at the College of Education here at the University of Illinois, wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.